get your phone out, and you center it in the field of view, and then you press the button and take the picture. Okay. On Hubble, we have no real-time field of view like that. So what we do is the astronauts, I'm sorry, the astronomers, they specify two guide stars, uh, and there'll be one on the right side of that object and one on the bottom, and we'll take two fine guidance sensors. They'll find those very specific guide stars that they were told about, and they'll lock onto them. And once they've locked on, that means that the telescope is pointed such that that's smack in the middle of the field of view of that instrument. Now the key is that <clears throat> lots of times we take pictures of objects and they're really far away. So sometimes they're over 13 billion light years away, and a light year is a trillion miles. So it's about as far away as get. And they're only a few pixels. So what happens if you take a picture and, and the camera's doing this? What's your picture going to be like? It's going to be very blurry. So we have a very stringent pointing requirement. And those fine guidance sensors, those interferometers, allow us to achieve it. So that pointing requirement is such that if I attach a laser, take the laser to the side of Hubble, and pretend Hubble's here in Washington, D.C., uh, it has say such that if that laser shines on a dime, and not just on the dime, but on the head of the president on the dime, and stays on the head of the president on it for however long I take the picture, up to 24 hours. Okay. Now, the kicker is, if, if that was impressive, the kicker is that this is in Washington, D.C. That dime would be over 200 miles away on the Empire State Building. And that is our pointing requirement that we have to meet. And those fine guidance sensors, sen uh, sensors allow us to achieve that. Okay. Uh, Hubble is controlled, meaning we turn it with reaction wheels. Uh, these are big wheels. Uh, they work off of the concept of Sir Isaac Newton, that for every action there is. That's right, the opposite of equal reaction. So if I have this big wheel, it's two feet wide, it weighs 100 pounds, and I spin it clockwise, Hubble's going to spin counterclockwise. That's how we turn Hubble. Uh, because it's so big, we have four of these wheels, and they're in a kind of a pyramid format, so that I can use any three to turn Hubble anywhere I need to be. Uh, but because Hubble's big and heavy, it turns slowly. So it takes me about 15 minutes to turn 90 degrees. So it's about the same speed as a minute hand on a clock. So you don't want to take a picture over here and then spin 180 degrees and take a picture over here and then spin it back 180 degrees because you're wasting a lot of time that you could have been just grouping things so you could take pictures and be much more efficient with the science. So the problem though, of course, is that Hubble, even though we're 340 miles up and I said we're above the Earth's atmosphere, that's not completely true because there is atmosphere up there. Now it's not enough for you and I to breathe, uh, but it does cause a problem. And that is it causes atmospheric drag, which means that our orbit will deteriorate over time. It can also cause So if I'm taking a picture, you know, and I've got atmosphere hitting as I fly through it, just like your car driving the road, you know, and I'm like this, it's going to cause a torque. It's going to cause a force that wants me to spin in a direction I don't want to be spinning. And you have other things like the solar wind that's doing that. So these things are building up as I turn Hubble to take pictures. Now the problem is I either have to spin Hubble a lot faster, the, the reaction wheels for Hubble a lot faster, compensate, and eventually I'm not going to be able to compensate because I can't spin the wheels fast enough, um, or I have